All right. Well, why don't we get started then? Uh, welcome to this um, this session, this webinar in a series of webinars that we've been doing at Vicente Cedarburg, uh, generally coming out of our impact in ESG practice. This webinar. With this webinar is uh, is directed really towards social equity entrepreneurs and applicants and licensees. It concerns cannabis real estate 101, and I am so so pleased to have such a distinguished panel of guests and experts to talk about these issues uh, with us today. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the at the end of the session, so please by by all means uh, fill in your Q and fill in. You can hit the Q and A tab and and put your questions there, and we'll vet those for answering at the end of the uh, experience here. And we'll also be putting this video out. Uh, you'll get a copy of it. You can watch it later if you can't sit around for the whole thing or you can share it with other people. So anyway, my name is Mark Ross. I am the head of impact and ESG at Vicente Cedarburg. For those that do not know, Vicente Cedarburg is a national cannabis, hemp and psychedelics law firm. Uh, we're based in Denver, but we have offices in eight cities around the country from coast to coast. Uh, I've been, associated with the law firm in various ways over the years, but joined the law firm in April of 2021 to stand up this new practice. We work on everything from corporate social responsibility to social impact, community engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and of course, environmental, social, and governance. My background is that I've been an environmental attorney for nearly 30 years in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Most recently, I was the director of community engagement for Harvest Health and Recreation. Uh, moving on along, Barrington. Barrington Rutherford is the CEO of Park Jordan, and I'd love, Barrington, if you could please tell the folks a little bit about your background. Hi, well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, I am Barrington Rutherford, chairman of uh, Park Jordan Real Estate, a, a full-service real estate firm here in New York that was organized, really, frankly, to address the, the opportunity uh, for expansion into the uh, adult use program in New York. Um, certainly other opportunities exist around the country and within, and, and especially here in the Northeast, but it was really the, the opportunity that New York will provide and the, the, the market, this will you know, likely be one of the, if not the largest uh, cannabis marketplace in the, in, in the country at some point, like at, at um, Barrington, I think you're muted there or you're freezing up. I'm a good lip reader, so I got everything he said. <laughs> nope, nope, we still can't hear you. Well, we let Barrington uh, work on his audio and uh, move on to Richard Acosta. Uh, Sorry about that, folks. Richard. Richard Acosta is a, a partner uh, at Green Tech Properties. Go ahead, Richard. Thanks, Mark, as always. Hopefully the line's okay. Uh, let me know if I have any, any issues. I'm happy to shut the video off and go on audio only. Uh, Mark and, and Vicente Cedarberg, thank you for, for putting this on. I think it's, it's an important uh, discussion. And you know the, the, the way we sort of think about the space is, is obviously through a real estate lens. And when I say the space, I mean... You know, cannabis broadly, but specifically, uh, you know, social and, and impact investing, right? So this is really an important topic to me personally. Um, I've been in the space, the cannabis real estate space since uh, 2016, uh, began investing uh, in a fund format in 2017 uh, across mortgage finance, mortgage origination, and sale leasebacks. So we've sort of lived and breathed uh, the really the expansion of this industry from you know our home state and hometown here in Los Angeles, California, across you know across the nation. So um, we've certainly seen you know the good, the bad. Uh, you know when when we're kind of asked to share our experience, we, we really do that um, with excitement, right? There are we'll touch on some of this here during the webinar. There are sort of uh, mistakes that we see repeated, right, by applicants and entrepreneurs, um, kind of as new markets open up, you see folks sort of jumping in on, on licenses and 
kind of tying up real estate or jumping into real estate deals without really doing their homework. And at the end of the day, some of those uh, some of those practices can come back and, and kind of bite you in the butt. So eager to kind of get into the meat of the conversation uh, and really excited to be here professionally before cannabis, just to kind of give some more context. Um, I was in the, in the private equity business at a firm called Colony Capital, uh, focused primarily on the uh, casino and hotel space. So certainly not a stranger to uh, real estate intensive industries. Um, and again, as, as Mark said, you know, we're, our business is known as Green Tech Properties, uh, focus across the cannabis supply chain, uh, primarily focused again on real estate sale lease backs and mortgage originations. Thanks, Richard. And we also have, uh, uh, finally, but but not least, and um, uh, we have Yaro uh, Kubrin, who's the director of real estate at CanDev. Uh, Yaro, uh, you want to tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Vincente Sinderberg, for you know standing this up this morning and BS doing what they do, and uh, you know just really happy to be here. I feel like I should thank my agent and the academy and. Uh, and hear the music in the background as I'm supposed to stop talking. But, uh, you know, your company has, I think VS stands for like the highest quality of diamond or something like that. But I, I think that definitely uh, your law firm has been a, a rock solid and shining beacon of uh, legal support, advisement and services in the regulated cannabis space. And so really just an honor to be a small part of this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm a second generation cannabis cultivator, earned my first dollar in cannabis 35 years ago, trimming for my mom's family farm. Um, uh, what can I say? Uh, the only two things I've ever done is cannabis and real estate, um, 20 units of real estate in college. And I'm a recovered realtor, did that for 11 years, but I've been in the real estate space for about 17. And along the way, I, I'm also a drug war veteran and um, for cannabis and um currently the director of real estate for CanDev, which is a commercial uh, cannabis retail development company that focuses on just retail. And we have a footprint in about five states. That's it. Well, thanks. I guess we should uh, give thanks also to NCIA on the side because uh, they, they, in essence, put Richard and I and Yarrow together back in December. Uh, in the same place uh, where, which was the generation, the genesis of this, this webinar. Barrington, are you back with audio? I think so. I hope oh. so. Is that, is that better? That is better. That is better. Great. Uh, if you, if you could please just finish up your introduction and then we'll move into the questions, I think. You sure. Were talking prior, about. Go ahead. Yep. Just was going to say prior to my current role, I uh, led the real estate department uh, at Cresco Labs. Um, we, we opened, I believe, around 26 dispensaries over the course of um, just under, just over two years. Uh, so we went on a, on, a, on a really strong tear. And I learned so much about like this intersection of, of cannabis and real estate, this, this high, these, you know, the, the highly regulated environment that, that cannabis can be and, and, and how that sort of, um, again, just sort of interacts with the, with the, the real estate market. So happy to be here and, um, you know, looking forward to the, the discussion. Great. Well, thanks. Um, moving on into the discussion, we'd like to start with um, a real baseline about uh, cannabis real estate versus regular real estate issues. And, and Richard, I think you'd be fantastic to, to lay the groundwork for that, if you could, please. Sure. Sure. Happy to. I, I think, you know, it's, it's important to, I guess, recognize and realize that you know, commercial real estate itself is complicated. It's sort of its own its own world, right? And it's, it's competitive. Um, a lot goes into the assessment, the underwriting, and ultimately negotiating and securing a commercial real estate asset for use or, or a lease, right? If you're a regular way business, you kind of add the, the cannabis component on top of commercial real estate and you've got a lot of moving pieces. If, if I could give folks advice with respect to cannabis real estate, broadly, I would say, uh, make sure you have a real estate expert on your team, right? In, in some way, shape or form, whether it's an advisor, a board member, investor, or even a really good commercial real estate broker, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, real estate is hyper local, 
and having somebody in your corner that understands uh, not only the nuances of commercial real estate, but understands really land use uh, regulations in a certain municipality that you may be considering relating to cannabis, that's incredibly important. A lot can be missed um, sort of upfront, as I was saying earlier, and you know, rectifying issues with respect to just basic things like environmental diligence, right? Um, basic elements like a building not being up to code, right? These are all discoverable elements up front um, that are hypersensitive sometimes uh, with respect to cannabis and can add to timelines uh, and, and time equals money. It literally does in cannabis if you've signed up a lease or a purchase agreement, um, if you need more time uh, between signing and you know, opening the doors, uh, it's gonna cost you. So um, doing a lot of that work up front is incredibly critical in commercial real estate broadly, but even more so with respect to cannabis. One other element I think that's worth touching upon that's a key difference is the financing markets, right? There, there is no real efficient bank mortgage market in commercial real estate. There's a lot of private money, um, there's a lot of folks out there that are sort of, you know, doing deals on a local basis. It's a lot harder to find capital if you're acquiring uh, a real estate asset. Um, so you have to you have to sort of plan ahead with respect to sourcing capital um, if you're looking to acquire an asset. If you're looking to lease an asset, uh, you know, you you really have to start early. It, anything you know in, in business can can be negotiated. Um, in commercial real estate, you sometimes have to get creative with landlords and uh, time can be your friend if you get started early on, on your searches. Um, you know, we as, as a firm have, have done a lot of sort of advisory type of, um, I won't call it work, it's not a formal business line, but we sort of have helped coach folks along with respect to just kind of plugging into the right team, forming the right advisory group to help them. Um, real estate at the end of the day is its own specialty and, and nobody should kind of go in there on their own without, you know, the right lawyer, the right sort of commercial real estate broker or experienced advisor. Yeah. Richard, one, one follow up for you, which is um, with regard to the financing piece, if you're a social equity operator, small mom and pop um, uh, from a community dis, uh, disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, or uh, perhaps you have uh, you were directly incarcerated previously, or are related to someone who was incarcerated recently. What are some of the um, avenues for obtaining financing uh, that are uh, perhaps non-traditional? Yeah, look, it's it's gr sort of groups like us, right? Funds that are dedicated to the space. Uh, you know, you don't have many yet, and I anticipate this changing. You don't have many groups that. Um, or specifically willing and, and interested and able to get their hands dirty, right? Um, your average sort of social equity applicant, um, you know, may need uh, a, a bit of coaching, right? A bit of just orientation with respect to lay of the land, sort of how negotiations work. Um, and, you know, that that is, it's more work for investors. And, you know, we're, we're the type of group that that is happy happy to kind of go through that. Um, there are others across the country um, that are as well, but, you know, unfortunately there's no, uh, there isn't sort of a, a national, you know, bank that you can kind of go to like a, or an SBA type of entity uh, that'll handhold you. Um, I think one, one interesting thing that, I, that is happening um, sort of on a regional basis is sort of the creation of, you know, accelerators or even pre-accelerators, right? Um, these are sort of non-for-profit non groups um, that are providing that technical assistance and that background um, to social equity applicants. And as a subset of, of those programs, you know, real estate is, is included in that. So it's, it's kind of poking around, looking for resources and looking for folks that, that are looking to, to be helpful. Um, no, no, no perfect answer, unfortunately. Um, and of course, one of the things that makes cannabis uh, real estate issues different than normal real estate issues uh, is the licensing issue that intercedes. And, and I wanted to uh, ask you, Yarrow, a bit about uh, some of the pre-licensing considerations and post-licensing considerations as it pertains to real estate. Absolutely. And um, before I answer that, I'd love to just sort of uh, piggy, piggyback on what Richard said. Um, uh, I think... Uh, 
regulated cannabis is like that movie Ocean's Eleven. You know, you need your gymnast, your safe cracker, <laughs> you need your bank, your getaway driver, like you need a good law firm, you need a good real estate person, you need someone that knows the difference between a terpene and a cannabinoid, you need somebody who understands what that license type activity is going to look like. If you're in extraction, that might be a very different person than if it's somebody in retail. And so uh, I think it's team first, play second. Um, and I think that that also uh, can help with, with the money side of things. You know, I, I think there's this misperception that dilution is the worst thing a cannabis entrepreneur can do or not do. And it's like, let's not forget, it's not what percentage of the pie you have, it's what is your percentage of the pie worth? Um, you know, as a verified social equity applicant myself, um, you know, I, I, there's places I, I don't want to try to be a jack of all trades or learn certain things. It's much better to find some people, vet them, spend some time vetting them, ink up some agreements and figure out what that team looks like before you just go out and try to hodgepodge it. I think there's this cliche in the industry about we're building the airplane while we're flying it. It's a terrible cliche. I think 100% of the time an airplane actually crashes when we use that analogy. So I think it's much better to really like focus on who am I going to do this with and what do they bring to the table? And, and I think the finance part is, is really important. Um, in terms of your question, you know, what do we do licensing, pre-licensing, you know, doing real estate and cannabis, I will just say, hopefully with like mic drop uh, emphasis, uh, with the exception of like genetics and intellectual property or medical research, I don't even think there is a cannabis industry. I just think that the cannabis industry is a niche of real estate. It just happens to be more highly regulated than probably any other real estate except for like nuclear power plants. Um, but it's real estate first and it starts with zoning and zoning is to real estate what DNA is to an organism. You know, it doesn't matter what your vision is if it's not compatible with the zoning. You know, people say, let me tell you my vision. I want to do a hotel with an extraction facility and the guests can come downstairs and look through a glass wall and watch the extraction facility. It's like, no, that's not going to ever work because the zoning doesn't allow for it. Or they say, I want to do a consumption lounge where I bring in a celebrity chef and they cook the food and infuse it right there. And it's like, no, that's not going to work because, you know, retail with a consumption lounge is a different zoning than manufacturing for creating edibles. So I think that it's really important to start with zoning and, um, you know, to be successful, ten, success tends to leave some clues and usually those clues are bags under people's eyes because they put the work in and instead of watching their favorite tv show they're they're looking at a county website and trying to you know plow their way through it so i think the first thing that always always i start with is zoning and without that zoning understanding you know i wouldn't even go look at a property without understanding the zoning first you know why speed network your way through a bunch of property owners or you know real estate for consideration without starting with zoning and then start with the maps um, because often cities will have areas where with the right zoning you're good and even and then other areas with with the right zoning you're not so good i know it's a common thing to want to beat up on government employees and they don't care about this and they don't care about that truth is in san francisco which is not known for being efficient or simple I've had great results with the Office of Cannabis. I've found that I got a lot of bees with honey instead of vinegar. I didn't go in with a, I pay your taxes, my, uh, my taxes pay your salary mindset. And I've just asked a lot of questions. And sometimes they've had the answers and sometimes they haven't and they've gotten back to me. And sometimes in me asking the questions, I'm actually helping them to figure out what their policy is because we're, we're in it together. So uh, sort of a spirit of cooperation and a willingness to ask questions and then, um, the zoning first and foremost, that's just so important. And, you know, typically if you check on the internet, zoning isn't like some really hard thing to find out and it's a little gobbledygook of code. And then you can go to like the city or county website and they'll have this list of what that gobbledygook means. Um, but all you have to do is cross reference that gobbledygook with what the regs say. And if you're in the right zoning, it makes sense to take that next step. Um, and typically that next step is, is, is going and putting eyes on something I don't think there's any substitute for putting boots on the ground um, and then understanding to Richard's point, some of these commercial considerations, ADA is not a new brand coming out with a new pre-roll, you know, understand what you might need to do in terms of code upgrade to a building, fire sprinklers, safety, um, 
and then make sure that whoever you're working with has allocated 25% more money than they thought they were going to need to and 50% uh, more time than you expected it was going to take to get there. And in Yaro, in terms of um, applying for a license, do you uh, typically see operators finding that property, putting eyes on the property before they apply or uh, and securing a lease beforehand or after they Abs get the license? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, I don't know of many cannabis permits, if any, that can migrate from a, from a property to another property. So most applications are property specific. Most local regulators will require with that permit application, a copy of a lease or a copy of a purchase agreement or an option to purchase. Um, so no lease or no purchase option, no bueno, no permit, you know, you're not gonna get very far. Um, so it, it does start with a real estate conversation. And, um, you know, it's not easy. Um, to go into these things undercapitalized and to try to figure out how you're gonna secure real estate. I think there's some great techniques to get around that. One is partner with the property owner. The other is to find something that's tenant occupied on a short term basis where maybe in the future, if you get that permit, then there's an opportunity to become that tenant. Uh, the other is to give them a pretty uh, healthy purchase option with a number that's above market. And then you have a lot of time, unfortunately, while you're in a permit pending status to figure out uh, how that's going to be uh, capitalized. Um, but it always starts with an address. No, no address. And, and, and that, to Barrington's point earlier, that's changing because there's a lot of pain points related to that, namely that there's typically carrying costs with an unknown period of time before you know whether you're going to get a permit or not get a permit. But traditionally, it has always required a, a property address first. Uh, of course, we're starting to see a little bit of a change with, with provisional permits, uh, licensing that, that is now coming out on the East Coast in some East Coast states uh, that will allow you to apply for a provisional license without actually having real estate secured, correct? Correct. And I think that's going to be a game changer. I think it's going to uh, lessen the amount of uh, capital that people need to raise prior to even having a clear line of sight on a permit. I think that it's not going to change it as much as people think it's going to change it because I think that speculators are still going to squat on high value real estate where the parking is good and the traffic count is good and the building is pretty and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at least, uh, you know, I think of uh, Kika Keith down in LA and the 1300 days it took for her to get Gorilla mm -hmm. RX up and permitted. And so that's a really long time. Most people's patience quotient is not as long as the permitting process. I think that uh, if people can get those permits and then secure real estate, it's going to help, especially for social equity operators who may not have access to funding or even have the, the Rolodex to begin to assemble their Ocean's 11 team. I think, Mark, if I can add, I think specifically uh, New York, it looks like, and, and Illinois, you can get conditional approval there. Um, and you'll get something like, I believe it's 30 days in Illinois and, and 180 in New York uh, to provide proof of, you know, a lease or, or a building. So it is changing to your point, and it, it's a huge, huge gating item, especially for, for social equity applicants. So very encouraging to, to see that. Um, the, the historic practice, as everybody knows, is you got to apply with the lease or, you know, or a deed. Um, you know, in, in some places, I think in, in Michigan, I've seen situations where you have to provide an actual uh, CFO certificate of occupancy, right? So even further in the development uh, of, of, you know, developing a retail store or uh, manufacturing processing facility. So it is, it is changing, but, you know, uh, it's, it's got to change, I think, a little bit quicker to, to really remove this as a gating item. Sticking with you, Richard, on the financing side of this, because you are an investor in, in real estate and this is what you do. Um, can you give some tips a bit about um, the identification of, of partners with regard to financing uh, that social equity operators should keep in mind as they are, uh, especially if, if they're not in a provisional license state and they need to identify that real estate ahead of time and, and secure a lease or a, or a, a purchase? Yeah, look, I think the path of least resistance is sort of what Yaro mentioned, right? If you identify a compliant, you know, adequately zoned piece of, of real estate, you should uh, try to approach the current landlord, 
right? That's generally the path of least resistance um, relative to trying to cut a purchase deal and, and finding an investor such as ourselves, right? So um, I, I, I'd give that really kind of the, the plan A. The, the plan B, if you do need to acquire a building, let's say the, the current owner of the building that, that you, know, you like uh, and that checks out from a zoning compliance perspective, if they're not willing and able to give you a lease and you got to call somebody like us, right? You, you do that really when you have your business plan put together, right? And your team put together and sort of line of sight to capital. At the end of the day, real estate investors are, are generally looking for two things at a high level, right? The value of the asset um, and they're sort of thinking, okay, what happens if I need to retenant uh, this asset or I need to take it out of the cannabis use? Um, that's number one. Number two is credit, right? Um, what what does this tenant look like? Do they sort of have, you know, their business plan together? Do they have their business together? Can I sort of believe in, in their ability to execute? So, um, before really even having that landlord conversation, you want to be as advanced as you can with the formation of the business uh, and and strategy. Um, that, that those would be sort of uh, I guess my my upfront advice. And if you're going to do a lease, make sure you have tons of renewal options, tons of renewal options. Yeah. For example, in San Francisco, my social equity distribution business is being incubated by a retailer. Uh, and the minimum requirement for that program in San Francisco is three years of rent. They have not given me any renewal options. Understanding the glacial pace of cannabis permitting, that means that 18 months into taking occupancy, I'm going to not only need to run that business, but also be searching for some other location to stand up the same permit and move my business over because there weren't any renewal options. So having some renewal options as a tenant and renewal options don't obligate you to stay there. They just give you the opportunity if you choose to. So, you know, uh, making sure that you have some runway. Uh, let's assume your business is going to be amazingly successful. Last thing you want to do is, is not have negotiated a lease that gives you the chance to really just dig in and run that business and know that that's the location you're going to be able to operate out of. Barrington, I think, were you trying to say something as well? Uh, you know, I was, I, I thought, thanks for, for, for seeing that. I was, I really wanted to, uh, and so far I agree with so much of what, of what um, the my co-panelists are, are saying. I think that the Yarrow is 100% right that that cannabis at bottom is a land use problem first. And and but these things are not uh, these are not silos. They go hand in hand. I would say that in my experience, a um, and even a small business, a social equity uh, applicant who has won a license it like once you have a license provisional or or otherwise in hand, and a properly zoned piece of real estate, I think finding capital is dramatically easier, right? So what the it's the, the these things that this is more of a fabric than these are like sort of uh, uh, individual silos that have to be that 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 have to be uh, solved for. Um, I think that that real this is especially true. I think in the so, sort of the eastern half of the country. Um, east of the Rockies, I think that landlords are much more interested in, I think that landlords are much more acknowledging of the reality that traditional bricks and mortar retail is declining. And cannabis is one of the few sectors, like it's one of the few industries where bricks and mortar retail spaces are being consumed, are willing to pay market rent, are able to pay, in some cases, a, a, a slightly above market rent. And so I think that you're finding that landlords are very much willing to uh, participate, right? So, and, I, and, and, and therefore, particularly in the states that um, do offer like provisional licensing as, as, as Richard mentioned, I think that those states, um, you'll find in those states, plenty of landlords that are willing to, to make substantial co contributions to tenant improvements and substantial, uh, in some cases that are even willing to, to uh, enter into to partnership agreements uh, if, if the state is, is, is willing to allow that. Um, it's a, it's the, the, the regulatory environment combined with, with land use. I think one thing I do disagree with uh, what Yarrow said, I think that zoning is can be incredibly complicated. And so 
to the, the larger point that was made early on, the importance of having the right team, having a, a, a building a team that is thoughtful about land use and zoning, is thoughtful about environmental considerations in, in these various uh, spaces. It is thoughtful about what it takes to, um, to meet the demands, the expectations of uh, financial partners in various markets or for various use type. And it's, it, manufacturing is very different from retail in, in, in any state. And, and in some states, it's, it's, one can be impossible, can be nearly impossible while the other can be you know, fairly easy. Um, and and a, a group of advisors, a team of um, whether they are consultants or attorneys or accountants, those who understand the regulatory environment as well as um, the as well as their specific disciplines, I think is is worth its weight in gold. Having that having that right Ocean's Eleven team. Um, exactly, it's pretty good. <laughs> Sticking with you, Barrington, you know, um, there, there are a number of licenses that have been established as we have gone through this evolution uh, with regard to social equity applicants and entrepreneurs um, to try to bring down barriers that exist with regard to the, the high capital requirements for getting into the cannabis industry. Can you talk a little bit about, I'd first like you to talk about, if you could please, micro licensing opportunities for cultivation and manufacturing, and then expanding beyond that to some of the other license opportunities that we're seeing for social equity applicants and, and some of the real estate considerations that, that an, uh, an operator would need to consider. Sure, I think the, I think the, the, the micro, um, just because of, of my bandwidth, I don't have my camera on, unfortunately. So you can't see me using air quotes here. But I think the micro license uh, that is is has been contemplated, in, particularly in many of the the, the East Coast uh, markets, is and I'm using air quotes because they're not so micro. If you really if you really model them out, like these are these are are can be very good businesses and can and can um, can can absolutely um, be meaningful uh, to their. This is not a lemonade stand by any means. These are these are um, uh, can be very substantial businesses from a revenue and profitability standpoint. They're also very substantial businesses from the perspective of um, of, of meeting all of the, the sort of like regulatory and, and and land use concerns as we as we've been discussing. They're also not inexpensive to to set up. I do think that the um, I think that the benefit is that they allow for the economic benefits of vertical integration to be achieved on a much smaller scale. And so, while if they can, they are substantial. They're not nearly as substantial as um, the 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 original like medical vertically integrated uh, licenses that you find in some of the the earlier states like New York or New Jersey. Uh, states that 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 legalized medical, you know, five to to ten years ago, uh, but they I think present really really uh, amazing opportunities to get in and, and have um, and, and have craft products and have um, you know this it it allows for specialization and and um, in various uh, form factors and I think they just present a really important opportunity for entrepreneurs to. Um, again, to get in and, and, and enjoy the benefits of, of, of vertical integration, specifically with that, that, uh, that micro license type. More broadly, I think in, again, particularly in the eastern half of the country, like many of the markets that, that we're seeing um, that have legalized adult use and are standing up those programs, especially Illinois, especially New York, like those are there are some phenomenal, really, truly phenomenal opportunities. Uh, and the states that have uh, put social equity first, the states that have led um, their, their, their legislation around the concept of social equity, one of the, the key features I think we, we're, we're seeing in, in almost all of them is that particularly for retail, identifying real estate is not a part, is not a requirement of the applications. And so the cost of being, uh, of submitting a, 
you know, a truly competitive application is dramatically less when you don't have to uh, apply with real estate that can't be that they, they can't be relocated. Um, and so I think that's just a, a really important distinction that we're seeing in 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 on the East Coast and in the Midwest, um, with some exceptions to, to the point I think that that Richard made or, or Yarrow on like Michigan is not one that is as as friendly uh, to social equity. It, it does require, uh, in most cases, just a, a, a very huge capital outlay. But I think you know the other states like like Illinois, New Jersey, and New York, Connecticut even I think has these has the ability for um, for for applicants who are not incredibly well capitalized to still be uh, competitive in their in their uh, as they seek licensure. And Barrington, with regard to some of the other, the non-micro licenses, some of the other ancillary, not ancillary, they're, they're, they're true cannabis businesses, whether they're delivery or um, social use venues, what are some of the real estate considerations that, that folks need to consider? Because oftentimes the barriers to get into those lines of business, those verticals are lower than, say, setting up a cultivation or a retail facility. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think with respect sp specifically to um, the the transportation and delivery, I think one of the things to to really dive into is just sort of, you know, when regulators when regulators come up with these license types, I think sometimes they don't realize that they are just as much as they are sort of regulating a cannabis program, they're also designing a marketplace, and so. Thought has is is unfortunately not always given to um, how the market uh, the marketplace participants will interact with these various licenses, and so I think with respect to transportation, one of the things to to be careful of is just you know being really thoughtful about uh, the the model about like modeling your business. What are the staffing requirements? Do you have to? Does the license require that you make you know, sort of only like point to point deliveries? Do you have to go back to the dispensary between each delivery? Do you have to have a facility where you are, where you can garage your vehicles at night? What are those security concerns? And like it, it can, on one hand, delivery can definitely be a license type that is less capital intensive than say uh, cultivation or manufacturing. But on the other hand, um, if under certain conditions and in some places, it's questionable whether that business can actually be profitable in because of the way, again, because of the way the other um, marketplace participants interact with um, or, or would interact with, with that type of business. I think that um, that was transportation. You also asked about, um, what was the other one? Social, uh, social use venues. Oh, social, social consumption, right? Like, yep. I mean, I think that those are, the, the really promising, really promising opportunity, um, and and an important one in, in just making sure that that people have you know sort of fair access and and ability to consume in you know in in safe places where they aren't you know sort of jeopardizing you know any any, any anything else. Um, I think one of the one of the main considerations that that I've been sort of um, contemplating as we as we've looked at them is. Um, the Clean Air Acts, right? So, under what conditions can you consume um, smokables within, you know, indoors in, you know, New York City or in Chicago? And are, how do you remain compliant with not only the the cannabis regulation and you know any land use considerations, but also with the terms of a lease and with the with the the the, the clean air legislations that. In many cases, don't allow indoor smoking, uh, except under under very very uh, strict conditions. And, and of I course, do I, think that social right. consumption lounges are the way of the future, though, because they're the way of the past. Because we're humans, and we don't want to have to get something and then not have some place to enjoy it. Um, so I do think that cannabis has always been something that's consumed primarily socially. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm excited for when regulation allows human beings to be as human beings have been 
and have have a have a vessel uh, for that. You know, we've got cities where you're allowed to purchase cannabis, but you can't consume it on the street or even in a public park or even in a hotel room, even if it's a vape cartridge. So uh, I'm bullish on consumption lounges in the medium and long term. And, and then I would also add from a real estate standpoint, the zoning may allow you to set up a, a social uh, consumption lounge somewhere, but unless you're engaging the community, the neighborhood, uh, the registered neighborhood associations, organizations, um, you're going to have a hard go at it, uh, either getting up and running or staying up and running. And so I think from a real estate standpoint, if you're looking to try to identify a location, um, you, you need to look beyond where you can set up a location and try to win over the community in advance of that effort. Otherwise, it could be off or not. Uh, the last issue we want to uh, area that we want to touch on um, before we move over into a summary and Q&A is with regard to due diligence for locations, basic due diligence around uh, real estate. Yaro, can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, if I had drank one more cup of coffee and we had another two hours, I would just go on and on and on and on about it. I mean, you know, caveat on tour, right? Buyer beware. Um, you know, don't assume that someone's going to disclose everything about real estate that you would want to know. Um, I think it's important, first of all, to have a budget for due diligence. Um, and I think that due diligence for commercial real estate, in addition to zoning, in addition to American with Disability Act, uh, access issues, whether something is handicap friendly. Um, uh, we talked before the Zoom started about uh, environmental studies of properties where they have previous uses such as a dry cleaner or an automotive place we call those a phase one phase two phase three environmentals understanding the history of a property and what types of issues can go along with that that, that history of usage um I, did i mention fire sprinklers uh you know the location that i'm a part of in first and Folsom in san francisco you know we've got a five hundred thousand dollar seismic retrofit for just one side of one wall because the building is was built in the uh 1800s and has a dirt floor um so uh you know you've got your security concerns roofing traffic uh, visible traffic counts um uh, there's there's a lot that goes into it. I, I would just say that that's a place where people uh, could never spend too much time, can never spend too much money. I mean, some some permits require uh, understanding what the noise impact of your usage is going to be. Separate from retail and cultivation, they even uh, people are concerned about light pollution from uh, supplemental lighting for either greenhouses or, or hoop houses. Uh, so due diligence, I think, is where like the rubber really meets the road. Um, I've heard a lot of people in this industry say, well, I lost a lot of money, but I learned a lot. I think if you want to lose some money and learn a lot, go to college, okay? Especially if it's not your money. Like, um, I think that, you know, I would rather say I lost a lot of money on due diligence and third party expert reports that helped me to understand what I was getting into before I started going too far down a path. There could be deal, deal killers, right? I mean, there's when you do due diligence, due diligence you're going to find some green light things that make you want to move forward further, some yellow, some, some yellow light things that may go, whoa, I'm doing a caution lap on this thing, or some red light things. And like with due diligence, my job, what I always think about in in terms of due diligence and just so you know i love due diligence so much i want to get like due diligence tattooed on my stomach like i didn't pick the dd life it picked me like i think it's i think it's you know you pr you, you preserve the capital you save yourself a lot of time you learn something and a lot of times you're actually providing information to property owners that they didn't even know is there asbestos around the uh, around the furnace in the boiler down below um uh so so I think that with due diligence, you know, we're really trying for me to always find the reason not to move forward. And if I can't find the reason why I don't move forward, I keep moving forward. But don't overlook those things. Don't be optimistic. Uh, uh, in my mind, it's like, let's find the deal killer. And if I can't find the deal killer sooner or later, there's actually a deal. And there's actually an opportunity and there's actually something that makes sense for everybody. But I would much rather. And the other thing I would say about DD is not only should there be a budget for it, but I would always budget 
to be running DD simultaneously at more than one property at the same time, because the chances that you're going to find one property and hit it out of the park and it's going to work for whatever license type was your intended vision. It's like, why would you ever put all of your chips on one thing and go, baby needs a new pair of shoes and roll those dice? It doesn't make any sense. So I think you have to have a budget for due diligence. You have to have a pipeline of properties under consideration. Ideally, you run that process concurrently, not sequentially. There's so many people that I've seen who haven't got their ore in the water and got their cannabis permit and been operating because they did it sequentially. And it took them 90 days with that property and then six months with that property and then four months with that property. Next thing you know, they're in a whole nother year and you see them at a conference and you're like, hey, how's that going? They're like, oh, well, all right. like just run it all at the same time. you know. Um, and, and so I think that really due diligence is where um, we protect the money we protect our time, we inform ourselves, and we make sure that these properties aren't just going to be money pits. So um, I'll stop rambling, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about what I think is the most important part of real estate. Hey, I'll, Yara, I'll, I'll underscore everything you just said. That's why you know I opened by saying, get going quickly, right? Time is not your friend here when you're trying to you know find find real estate, whether you're buying or leasing. And I mean, everything you just said, right, you, you can you can duplicate it on the leasing side, right? Some of what you described is, you know, certainly applicable if you're buying a building, but if you're leasing, I mean, you need to really check all the same boxes. And there are, you know, depending on your lease negotiation and what it is that is in front of you, you could be on the hook for some of those expenses, right, post-close, post-signing of your lease. Um, so you talk about a money pit, even if you don't own a building, and if you're not careful in the lease negotiation, you could really be on the hook for material expenses. Um, everything from, you know, code compliance, ADA to, you know, you miss something on the roof and, and you signed a lease, that's an absolute triple net. You gotta go fix the roof yourself as the tenant. So um, diligence is important, whether you're buying or leasing. So really, really well said, Yara. Yeah, I know we've got some questions. Um, Jen, can we go to some summary slides, just um, some tips that we all came up with uh, that people can take uh, home with them. In the, in the meantime, if the speakers want to take a look at the Q&A um, tab and pick up questions or answers that they want or questions that they want to answer, that would be great. So uh, real estate 101 tips, move early on your property search and canvas uh, with the help of a local commercial real estate broker. Uh, you can get the worst deal on anything when you must have it. Uh, so don't wait till the last minute. Uh, engage real estate counsel with specific experience in commercial real estate transactions before signing a lease, option, or purchase agreement. Don't just find the neighborhood lawyer generalist that um, says they dabble in real estate. Uh, budget for administrative delays and legal challenges, which can extend licensing timelines and add carry costs. Uh, and related to that is also one needs to have patience that the cannabis licensing and permitting process often moves at a glacial pace. Vet and interview every possible partnership opportunity. Uh, don't just assume that someone's coming to the table with money and they're gonna be completely um, a, a perfect match for you as a partner. Uh, you need to vet them and interview them and compare your options. Uh, include mutually reciprocal inspection provisions in the contract and spell out what recourse you would have if there's a breach. Uh, watch out for folks who have indicated that they can't be more specific in the agreement because of pending rules and regulations. Consider adding contingencies to the agreement that will allow for flexibility in anticipation of the forthcoming regulations. So if the regulations say this, we're going to do this. If they say this other thing, we're going to do this other thing. And then uh, lastly, uh, if you are a legacy operator, and hopefully some of you on this, on this webinar are, lean into your legacy history. Be unapologetic about being ahead of your time. Own it. Uh, we're obviously starting to see uh, license opportunities for legacy operators and a very concerted effort to bring legacy operators into the legal marketplace. Um, you should wear that like a badge of honor and, and lean into all the opportunities that are constantly now being created with every new licensing regime that comes online to bring in legacy operators. We weren't so good about it in the beginning. California can attest to that right now presently, um, but we're starting to see movement in that front, I think, 
especially as we're getting into the New York marketplace, which is uh, arguably the largest legacy market in the United States. Mark, so if I can, I just want to say like that, that final part, like that's, that's my, like I wrote that and I, for the social equity operators on this call, like we don't, we don't need to have our history be something that we are uh, like a, like a shadow on us because it's not, and there's nothing more demoralizing and dehumanizing and degrading than having an AR-15 pointed at your shoulder because of your participation with a plant before the regulations caught up. And uh, that process, that process of being a criminal defendant, that process of asset forfeiture, that process of, you know, the war on drugs, um, people walk away with a lot of pain and trauma around that. And when social equity operators interview with incubators or landlords or potential uh, property owners, it's hard to remember that like, we don't need to be ashamed of that, that there's nothing wrong in that, that society has finally recalibrated and that in the history of social justice, you know, there was the women's right to vote. There was a civil rights movement. There was a right for gay people to get married. And that now we're realizing that these cannabis prohibitions from yesteryear were really a war against communities and families, specifically communities of color, but not just. And so I just think that people uh, you know, there's this, this misconception from people outside the space that, oh yeah, people who sold cannabis, that's because they couldn't make it in the real world. It's not easy to be a successful cannabis entrepreneur in a pre-regulated market. It takes a lot of skill. And so I just want to tell everybody on this call who is a social equity operator, or has legacy experience, like big ups to you and just own it because it gave you a lot of strength and a lot of skill and a lot of knowledge. Excellent. Excellent points, Yaro. Thank you so much. It looks like people want you to start a podcast. People want you to come speak at their their coffee, their coffee clutches. Um, I think you can take this road, this this show on the road for you. Um, questions, um, speakers. Have you seen any of the questions that you would like to answer? I can just start going through them and directing traffic. Go for it. Okay. Can the retail dispensary license be used as collateral to secure commercial real estate? What have people seen with regard to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, I, I've seen deals where uh, folks that are providing capital, whether it's real estate capital or, or an investment in an operating business have, have uh, taken and assigned value to those licenses. Uh, as a general statement, um, you shouldn't really consider that license portable to, to another operator. So it's, it's a bit tricky to, I think, lean on that as, as collateral too heavily. But, you know, at a minimum, I think the, the, the prevailing thinking is if you have some ability um, to attach yourself to the license with negative covenants, you know, it'll be um, a detractor or a deterrent, right? Um, relative to the, the financing not being repaid. So um, I have seen it and really you only find that uh, dialogue or that conversation with folks that have deep cannabis industry experience. Um, if you're talking to a regular way, sort of real estate uh, investor or lender, uh, they're, they're probably going to ignore uh, the, the potential value of the cannabis license. We have a couple questions about predatory practices of landlords um, and charging excessive or more than market rates for cannabis properties. What are some tips that you have with dealing with potential landlords like that, especially if you really want the property and it checks all the boxes for you? I think uh, personally, the, the, the short answer is just discipline. I think that like the being unwilling to be, you know, sort of um, like being, un just being simply unwilling to pay the, the cannabis premium and, and approaching every negotiation with that as a gating issue that you will be informed about what the market rate is when you go into a marketplace and that you're not willing to pay two or three times that. I think the importance of that discipline is if you look historically, the, the earlier uh, sort of cannabis operators, in some cases, some of the largest companies in this industry, but the ones who did that, the ones who went in and 
made deals that were for for rent that were two and three times what the what what market rate was generally did not do well. Their real estate costs, their the 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 decisions that they were making in in real estate were, I, I think, in many cases, almost microcosms of bad decisions that that many of them made in other areas of their business. And so having discipline around paying a fair price for um, the resource that you are, you know, that you want, whether it's, it's a, you know, a great retail site or a piece of equipment. I think that it just being disciplined about it and approaching the negotiation from that perspective, in my experience, yields results. When I started in cannabis real estate, we, we were still seeing new dispensaries opening in industrial parks. And by the time I left, uh, say Cresco as an example, um, the most common next door neighbor that we had for, for retail spaces was Starbucks. And that happened just by being disciplined about being unwilling to accept, you know, second, third, fourth class sites, and also being disciplined about a willingness to, um, to, to, to pay market market rates. Okay. Uh, there have been a couple questions, actually more than a couple, about New York State recognizing that the regs aren't out yet and things are developing very quickly there. Also recognizing if you are in New York, there is, an, there is a, I'll give a, a plug for our friends at the Business of Cannabis. They're doing an event tonight uh, in Williamsburg. Uh, I think it just moved from the Hotel Williamsburg to another local hotel. And uh, of course, I'm sorry, the William, the William Vale Hotel, William Vale. And of course, Barrington will be speaking there as well. And I'm certain that real estate issues will come up there. Um, but but talking, looking just briefly at New York or generally in new markets that are coming on board that are looking to get social equity operators up and running and, and really putting an emphasis on that, providing financial assistance and whatnot. Um, what can be done about landlords that may be hesitant to um, to lease to social equity operators, formerly incarcerated individuals or other individuals um, that come from communities that have been um, economically um, impacted by the war on drugs, and you may have a landlord that may be hesitant. How, how can we get those landlords into the game and participate? It sounds like Yarrow's got- I would a, just tell them there's a highest and best use opportunity for their property. There's an end of prohibition one time. You know, they're going to get to be able to pull this gold ring one time. And, uh, and, and if they're not open to it, think of this as speed dating and don't try to, you know, change one person's heart and mind because there, there's a lot, of, a lot of people who I think are very receptive to it. If not for the reasons that matter in my heart, at least for the reasons that matter in their wallet. And, uh, you know, they're in the right zone. They're in the right zoning. Uh, they're on the right street. And if they want, if they want to benefit from from the legalization of cannabis, great. If they don't, if they don't understand that those those laws that previously created incarcerated cannabis operators, that those were inherently sort of not right, I wouldn't try to convince them. I would just move on to the next one. The other thing I would say is persistence. You know, let look at the Grand Canyon. Who won, the water or the rock? Just keep dripping. Eventually, something will break open. Looking at New York, Barrington, do you have additional thoughts on that? Because I'm sure you're there. I mean, your company is there. I think you're in Chicago, but um, your company's in New York and, and hyper-focused on New York right now. So what are some tips uh, that you have found in getting landlords on on board? You know, I think that there's a, a, a very substantial difference um, today than there was even one or two or three years ago, particularly in other markets. What I find is that landlords are, who believe that they're eligible are seeking opportunities. There's a lot of retail vacancy in New York. And so I think that, that landlords, you know, would, are, are really actually looking for their, their chance to get, to do long-term deals with, with folks that have won uh, cannabis licenses. I think that the ones I agree completely with Yarrow and to frankly, a point that, that, that Richard made earlier. So to the idea of this being, you know, kind of a fabric, like putting these ideas together, like number, like time is not on your side, right? Like this is a, 
you, this absolutely is speed dating. You have to, you know, you, you have to be, you have to be judicious with the resources that you'll invest as you're doing this diligence on, on various properties, like the time and energy and capital that you invest into studying into 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 um, qualifying these sites for 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 dispensaries, you just have to be really judicious and 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 um, careful with how you are are alloc allocating those resources. Time is not your friend, so changing hearts and minds is possible, but it's time intensive. And so I just think that there's so many people, especially in New York, that are excited about um, about legalization of, of, of cannabis for adult use, that when the ones that you find who are not interested, I would move on quickly. Uh, the, the, your landlord is looking for you too. You just have to you know, stop wasting time on the, on the guy that, 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 that isn't going to do this deal. All right, look for a long-term partner. Yeah. Um, we, unfortunately, we're out of time and there are more questions. I know that there are more questions. We'll try to get to some of those and respond. Um, but in the meantime, these are our contact, uh, our contact information. Uh, if you would like to reach out to anyone in particular, uh, again, we appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, if you liked what you've seen here, make sure you are on our mailing list because we're going to continue to have uh, more 101 types of webinars for uh, social equity um, entrepreneurs and, and licensees. We feel that, that it's part of our uh, ethos here at Vicente Cedarburg and part of our impact that we're trying to provide to the industry. And so thank you for your time. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks to our panelists. Fantastic. Uh, look forward to doing it again, taking the show on the road and uh, looking forward to crossing paths with each of you over the next uh, several months. So thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thanks, everybody.